So as I mentioned at the outset of the service after the beautiful introduction of Eli, Eli, that this is an unusual Shabbat in that it falls between three modern Jewish holidays. Modern day Yom HaShoah last week, or a few days ago, Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaZikaron, which is the day in Israel to remember the soldiers who helped establish the day of Israel, state of Israel, who defended the state of Israel, and recently were acted victims of terror that we memorialize them as well. And then the next day, we go from the sadness of that day to the joy of Yom HaAtzma'ut, which is Israel's Independence Day. My wife is there right now. She told me she's there for, with a bunch of other people, and they're, they're looking forward to what is going to be a special time. So we decided that we would each take one question about each of the holidays. And so I'm going to share a question with that Canada Lutz. She'll respond, um, and I'll respond, and then we'll go to each holiday and just the thought here and there, right? Lovely. Okay. So here's my first question, Canada Lutz. <laughs> Canada Lutz for 200. It's <laughs> <laughs> so looking back and thinking about Yom HaShoah, mm. is there a lesson that you've learned from the Shoah or from a survivor that has shaped your life? Well, as a Jew, I've done so much reading on the Holocaust, and there were times in my life where I felt such a need to learn about it in order that I might understand it. Mm. And of course, I, I still haven't gotten to that place, um, but it almost at times can become an obsession, yes. right, to go through periods where you will read voraciously about it um, so that you might be able to understand how human beings could treat each other in such a way. Um, so I haven't been able to understand it, but with that, I think of three things. One, I think, um, and I heard Michelle say on Tuesday, that we can't be bitter. Um, even when the most horrific things happen in our world, we can't stay in that place of pain and bitterness. That doesn't mean that we have to deny it or push it down and not feel it, but we have to move forward from it. Um, and I think, you know, living in Los Angeles, right, I, I hear people all the time feeling bitter. I don't have this. I don't have enough. Mm. I'm not enough. Um, it's not a good place to be in. Um, so to hear someone who's sur survived such atrocities not be bitter is a real inspiration to me. And she also said, if you see something, say something, yes. right? Sort of like we on did. the subway. Uh, if you <laughs> see someone doing something wrong, speak up. Right? And it doesn't have to be in an abrasive way or in an aggressive way, right? On social media, we see so many people calling each other out for things. Mm. Um, I don't think she meant it in that way. It's more like, you know, whenever I see someone um, drop a piece of trash, first of all, I assume they're good intentions. I assume that they didn't mean to drop the trash. Um, but I, I, I often run after them and I'll say, do you see that you, you dropped that? Instead of picking it up for them. Right, because I want them to be responsible for what they're doing. Um, so just it can be on, on the smallest scale, sure. and you can assume the you can assume that someone is doing something for good, even if you see that they're doing something bad. You don't have to jump down their throat. Hmm. And then lastly, I think I've just learned the importance of family. When Michelle was talking about her brother, he mm -hmm. he stole a Nazi uniform. He spoke perfect German. He got her out of the camp. Um, the love that her brother had for her and the amount of danger he must have put himself in. Um, I, I'm really lucky because I know my brother loves me that way. Hmm. Uh, so I just think, you know, what are we if we don't have family? What are we if we don't have each other? Hmm. What about you? So I want to pick up on something that you said in quoting her mm -hmm. about not feeling bitter. Um, she said that she and her husband, she was a survivor who spoke to our children and our congregation on Tuesday. And she said, we decided we weren't gonna be victims, we were gonna be survivors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important philosophy to have in life because victims destroy, people who are bitter destroy, but people who are grateful tend to wanna to build up. So I, I just fully agree with you. I do think, by the way, if one has an obsession reading about the Shoah, it's a good obsession. What better obsession to have than to read about evil? That leads me to a lesson that I think we should learn as a world. You have to fight evil. 
if you don't fight evil, it proliferates. And it's an evil that unfortunately we've seen other times ever since then, not only the Jews, of course, I, Jews are what we're focusing on now, and appropriately so. So I think that's the second lesson, that you have to fight evil. And the third thing that, that I often think about when I meet a survivor, and I'm, I'm blown away at how happy they seem and well-adjusted they seem and how they came from whatever they experienced, which is unimaginable, to having children and raising a family and going to work and building a society and being good people who cared about making this world a better place. Mm. And I think, wow, we often think, are there miracles in the world today? And I think they're walking miracles. I really think many of them are walking miracles because if, if we had met any of them when they had been liberated in 1945 or wherever they were when the war ended, if someone would have said to them, some of you will be in America or in Israel, you know, 65, 75 years later, and you will have gone to work and raised a family and maybe had children and grandchildren, they would have said inconceivable. Mm -hmm. So I think they're inspirational to all of us. And as I said, I'm not the only one to say this, but we are the last generation who will ever meet a Holocaust survivor. So if you have the privilege of meeting one, Take a few minutes and ask them some questions. I think I hugged Michelle about 80 times. You did. I noticed that. So. <laughs> With her consent. Right, but absolutely. I just didn't want to let her go. It was almost like she wasn't real. So let's look at Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. We have a Memorial Day here in the United States. Right. How is it experienced in Israel that might be different than its experience here in the United States? Such a good question because it's so different. Uh, right, if you think of Memorial Day in America, we think of barbecues and sales, sort of a light July 4th, um, which is not to say that there's anything wrong with that. I think in America, we have a privilege, at least my generation. I, um, I know many veterans, American veterans. Both of my grandfathers were veterans. Mm. Um, our dear friend, Rabbi Josh Noble, is a veteran. Um, and, and thank God I don't know personally, you know, people of my generation who have passed away in service to our country. In Israel, that is not a privilege that anyone has. Right. Everybody knows somebody and is related to somebody who has lost their life in service to the state of Israel. Um, hmm. And just having lived there for a year for my cantorial studies, on that day, right, Tali, you know, the whole country stops. The siren goes off, and um, everyone, I have the, the chills just thinking about it. It's a moment of in, just community. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows how everybody else feels. Can you imagine what our world would be like if people were so empathetic to each other, mm. so understanding, so sharing of a feeling, even a tragic one? Right. Well, I think you said something important. There was a ritual established. Holidays that don't have rituals tend to lose their meaning. So one of the reasons I think Passover is so meaningful to people is there's a clear ritual of Passover with the Seder. Right. July 4th, American Independence Day has no ritual. So people, they'll do a few things, they'll go to the park, they'll have a barbecue. Memorial Day, similarly. If we took people to, um, to the graves of veterans, they would probably feel a lot differently, people who died. The other thing is Israel's constantly under threat. So there is this tremendous appreciation. America is fortunate, part of it is geography, part of it is strength. Most of the time we don't feel physically threatened. And I think as a result, we may not fully appreciate um, our veterans as much as uh, those who've lost their lives. But I'll tell you for me, one particularly moving moment is when I went to Normandy. And if you've been to the beaches of Normandy, many of you have certainly seen it if you've not been there on video and stuff, and you see the, the graves, the crosses, the Mogan Davids, for these young men, you know, 17, 18, 25, some older, who knew they were going to die. I just finished a book about this called The Nazi Conspiracy, which talks about what happened at Normandy in some detail. And I remember being there and just having tears in my eyes for people who I know fought for liberty. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, you're absolutely right. Here we tend to take it not quite as seriously. I also think in Israel there's a sense of pride in being an Israeli. That used to be true for Americans. I think it's waning, unfortunately. 
I hope it will come back, but I think when it does, there'll be a greater sense of appreciation. So last question, because it's a, mm -hmm. let's leave on a high, a Yom Ha'atzmaut, right? That's the celebratory, that's, if you're gonna be in Israel for one day, that's the day you wanna certainly try to be in Israel. It's Israel's Independence Day. So I wanted to ask you, did you have a memorable moment in Israel during that year or any other time that you've been there? Sure, I'm actually thinking of Yom Ha'atzmaut because it sort of feels like the clock strikes midnight <laughs> and right. Israel turns back into a pumpkin because yeah. it's Yom Zikaron, right? You go, go to Har Herzl, you see the graves of all these great people, everyone is somber, the siren goes off, all of what we talked about, Yom Zikaron, and then immediately at sundown, mm the entire country's energy shifts into celebration. <laughs> and it, honestly, for me as an American Jew, it was kind of a shock to the system. Uh, but it was an experience that I'll never, ever forget. And I was with all my classmates, and everyone's wearing white and waving flags and celebrating raucously. And it's just, it, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like it. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing. But what's, what's left to me is the juxtaposition of how you started speaking, right, which is, we live both with tragedy and joy. I think that's really what it is to be a Jew. Mm. Um, and, and to see that manifest was just incredible. Which also shows, by the way, you can control your emotions. You're feeling sad and then all of a sudden you realize, you know what, I'm gonna turn it around and be happy. So since I knew the question, <laughs> I decided to think about a memorable moment for me. And it was when my wife and I took our children to Israel for the first time. And uh, let's see. Uh, Josh, this was 2005, so Josh was 11 and Daniel was 7. And we did what most do when they have the first trip to Israel. We went to the, to the Kotel, to the Western Wall. And I was watching my two sons walk across the plaza to the wall. And I decided to stand back and watch them from behind. And this is pre-smartphones. I had a video camera on my shoulder there's a tradition that you put little notes in the wall. As a matter of fact, I wrote about that uh, in Monday's Kavanah. You're gonna hear different, different of our members of our clergy wrote next week about Israel. So my children, they were in school here. All of their classmates had written little notes and they were there to deliver them prayers and they had them in little plastic bags, those you know baggies or whatever they're called, right? and they're walking towards the wall, and I'm standing behind them maybe 10 feet. I'm crying so hard, the video camera is shaking. Mm. I could hardly get a picture in. And as I was leaving my house tonight to come here, I remembered in our living room there's a picture. So I brought it. I have the picture of my, my two sons. You, I don't think you can see it here, but approaching there, putting their, you know, they're this high, each with kippot, and that was the first time they've been to Israel. Daniel, my younger son, has since spent six months living in Israel, and when I picked them up from the airport, it's part of the Tiferet program at Milk, and this was many years ago, I said, Daniel, how was your trip? And these were his words to me. He said, Daddy, living in Israel is consequential. <laughs> you know what? Amen. Absolutely right. Thank you, Cancer Club. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rabbi. Wow. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. God Thank bless you. Thank you for being with us.